On the breakfast ahead of the 2023 elections, Nigeria's Inspector General Police says no state governor will be allowed to prevent opposition political parties from holding rallies in the state. This comes as the River State uh, has passed a new bill uh, stopping uh, prohibiting political parties from engaging in certain activities. We look at what the situation is in River State as it relates to the order of the Inspector General of the Nigeria Police Force. Also on The Breakfast, we'll be talking sports with Monday Thomas, a sports journalist, this morning. And uh, of course, we'll have uh, a look at what the newspapers have for us today, looking at the front pages and the big stories with analysis coming up next. We're back with the Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Very good morning to you. My name is Kofi Bartels. And I am Messi Ebopo. It's good to be back on your screen this morning. Yes, it's a Friday. Yes, indeed. <laughs> a beautiful Friday morning. And uh, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, we'll be getting into the heat of things, especially. I'm looking forward to the topics, uh, topic number one. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. You know, and um, let's see what our guests will, will say. Um, but before we get into that, um, as usual, usual, we'll tell you to sit back, relax, and enjoy a cup of tea or coffee, even if it's water you can afford, uh, and just, uh, you know, enjoy the show. Mercy, I was coming to work this morning, the, uh, the cab that dropped me in work, okay, the taxi that dropped me off at work this morning, he was complaining, you oh, know, what? about when he was in Lagos traffic, you know, at around 6 a.m. he was complaining, and he said, uh, how will he spend the night in a, a queue at a petrol station only to come and burn the fuel on the traffic in the morning and he didn't find it funny uh, at all uh, so it simply sh shows people are still sleeping in the queues and people are still so ask him oh boy yeah um how how um how many hours did you spend on the queue he said he worked all night and went there at about 4 a.m and he was able to get fuel at about um uh, 6 a.m you know, that's when he got the fuel. At what time did he hit the road? He hit that six. That six. So, so it shows that um, people are still are still queuing and they're still having a lot of uh, difficulties. You know, getting petrol. Yeah. I, I also like, saw a very long queue on my way, mm -hmm. and I thought that we had, you know, overcome all of that, especially when the DSS had mentioned that they had given an ultimatum, mm -hmm. and uh, the Nash Assembly also <laughs> had said, hey, NPC should reduce, you know, mm -hmm. the price, or has also given an ultimatum that. Uh, there should be petrol being sold out. But I don't think that that's addressing the issue. It's quite unfortunate yeah. because the cost of transportation has gone. You know, it's on the high as we speak right now. And like we would always say, I remember once upon a time we had a Vox Pop, which will always, you know, live and be relevant. Hmm. The, the, you know, the cost of living is on the high. People are pretty <sighs> upset. And, you know, salaries have actually not gone up. So, uh, but it's well. It's all right. Fine. That's all Let, let's get a top, a first top trending segment, a uh, story rather. This is uh, somebody who, you know how my friend uh, Mujahid, al Haji Mujahid at Sari Dokubo, uh, you know how he normally would, um, you know, would, would talk. He say, you think say day wise. <laughs> <laughs> he had that interview. He said, you think say day wise. 70 year old man. You know, this guy, we can say the situation is a you think say day wise situation. Um, mercy. And uh, imagine we have uh, a, a uniformed <clears throat> public servant, a public. Uh, yeah, public servant, making 40,000 naira every day. You know, I was calculating this thing while going through the story. If he makes 40,000 naira every day, hmm, and in a, in a week, let's say he works Monday to Friday, he'll make 200,000 naira. And in a month, he'll make 800,000 naira. I said, oh my God, look at him. You think so, day wise. This is a <laughs> last, an official of the Lagos State Traffic Management Authority who has been arrested. He's a fake traffic officer. So he wears a uniform and goes to stand there. He's not appointed by the agency. He's not, uh, you know, nothing. And he confessed that he makes an average of 40,000 naira daily. Just like that. Just like that. 40,000 naira daily. Um, the, the Lagos State Traffic Management Agency put out a statement to its public affairs department. Um, and the director of that department confirmed uh, that this, this young man, 
you know, was nabbed by the agency's patrol team while on duty monitoring and controlling traffic around the Lekki Axis. You know, and they commenced investigations and the investigations revealed that he belonged to a criminal gang uh, that has been extorting huge sums of money from innocent motorists who they apprehend for various traffic offenses, uh, <laughs> ranging from seatbelt uh, offense, obstruction, illegal overtaking, and one way uh, driving at different locations in, in Lagos State. I think we'll leave it at that. Um, but it was, it was fully kitted, fully kitted with LASMA uniform, uh, on, but it was rented on a black jean. That's it, that's it. That's, that's, that's why what, he was spotted. That's why I say he thinks he did wise. <laughs> <laughs> he was wearing black jeans. But, but, but yeah. I mean, uh, Kofi, for how long um, did he continue with this, you know, scheme until he was caught? Mm -hmm. you, you can only imagine, right? You can only imagine that that had happened for a very long time before he was apprehended. Now, one of the comments that got to me was one that uh, I read, you know, when this news broke out, was the fact that look at how he looks. It's almost saying, ah, this young man is earning 40K in a day and he's, he's, he's looking like this. Why is he looking like this? But that's, uh, you know, that's on the one hand. But to be very honest, it, it brings us to the issue of impersonation. Impersonation is one thing that's, that's been going on, you know, in the system, especially uh, the security or uniform system, if you like to say. Now, it, it won't be the first time we're hearing that some persons have been apprehended. You have fake police officers, fake military officers. How, how did their... Um, how were they able to man over the system? How were they able to, you know, go ahead and look very authentic without identification? It just shows that there's a lacuna. There's a lot that needs to be done uh, to close the gap, right? We need to find a means of identification. We need to be able to um, get to that point where we ensure that we, the original can be spotted. I mean, you, you have the original with some uh, authentic, uh, authenticity, you know? That's it. So that when you, so apparently, all, all, I mean, at what point did we discover that he was wearing a black on uh, the upper part? Because usually uh, the other color would be like a maroon color because that's what they wear. So it's like a maroon over uh, a lighter shade of yellow or cream color, if you want to say that's the uniform. So we, will, I think we need to do a lot, and that's why we constantly say that as a country, we can continue to be reactive. We have to be proactive, because people are thinking ahead. We have to think ahead of this, you know, element who take advantage of the system. So, I mean, just imagine how many persons are out there uh, defrauding innocent citizens or people uh, of their hard-earned money. It's, it's unfortunate, but let this be. I hope that we can learn something from this and we can put our acts together as a country and every security outfit. There's another story prior to this one where, you know, a military officer was apprehended, fake one at that. He was about to, you know, fly an aircraft, a certain aircraft or maybe, you know, a jet or thereabout. Just imagine how were they able to replicate, you know, this outfit and look original. So there's something that um, someone actually said that if, we were const if, you, if you're constantly exposed, how do you have the FBI or you know, the people identifying a fake note, like a fake currency? That's because you have to expose them over time to the original. But maybe we have to have something very distinct. Because for Nigerians, I think that you know, we're extra. We, we're just very talented, smart, and, and what have you. People are thinking 100 you know, yards ahead of you. So, we have to double up as a people, as a government. Kofi? Yes, um, uh, well, there's nothing much to add uh, except to say that um, the, the, the last month officials who arrested him, uh, you know, they have also themselves a, a question to answer. Is it that, you know, the, this, this, this criminal um, saw an opportunity? How did he know that he could make that amount of money every day? How is it that the, the, the drivers, the vehicle owners who were apprehended for these crimes, paid directly to him? There's something in this. It, it, it means, I mean, if there is no demand, there'll be no supply, okay? Or if there is no supply, you know, you can't do a demand. So this, this, this to me is a pure demand and supply situation. And it's... Um, an indictment is almost like the Lassma officials reporting themselves. It's an indictment on, on Lassma to say, well, 
It says motorists out there are used to paying money directly to the last month officials. When we know if you have a fine, pay into the government account. You're not supposed to give any public official money directly. It's against the code of conduct. And it is against the, the modus operandi or the workflow of, of, of LASMA, Lagos State Traffic Management Agency. So how is it that motor, you know, road users, you know, drivers are comfortable to pay this money to an official? All right? So, That's number one. Why is it they're comfortable to pay this money to the official? Number two, how come an official, or uh, sorry, a, 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 this fake official, a member of the public is so comfortable and confident that he can make money off the public, you know, that he say, oh, there's an opportunity to make money, oh, let me go and stand there. It shows that these officials, it actually proves what people have been complaining about all along, all these weeks, months, saying, yes, right, the last one officials have turned their job into a money-making venture where they enrich themselves, you know, they enrich themselves. And for me, that is the bigger, the bigger, because it doesn't make any meaning, it doesn't mean anything if the agency arrests this, this, this fake officer and puts him behind and prosecutes him or hands him over to the police. If their own officials continue to do the things that we know they are doing, okay? If they continue to do the things you know they are doing, then what's the use? There's no difference now. For we in the public, it means that we are still paying you know, uh, uh, money to last month officials when we shouldn't be paying those monies, okay? They are stipulated fines for stipulated crimes. So if your officials last month now keep collecting money from Lagosians, Nigerians, road users into their pockets, then what difference does it make when you catch a hoodlum? It means your officials are also equally hoodlums. They're also criminals because it's against the law for you as a public officer to collect money from any member of the public in the course of discharging your duties. It is wrong. So what I would like to say is LASMA needs to do some soul searching, okay? Then do some soul searching to find out what's going on and to talk to themselves and to go after officers. You know, abroad, even in Nigeria, but we know the police doesn't do it well. Abroad, you have what we call internal affairs in the U.S. police. You know, you see the movies now, right? Uh -huh. uh, we have internal affairs where they investigate their own officers, all right? In the Nigeria Police Force, Force we call it, we have what we call the Department of the Office of the Provost Marshal, who is meant to also investigate police officers because they don't do it except we take cases to them. So last one is to have, if they don't have it already, and in a mechanism internally to catch the officers who collect money. You know, when they do that, when they do that, I'll be interested. This one is okay, but it doesn't make any difference to me Bokufi, if your officials still collect money. I, I know that we need to Let's move on money. to, you know, the next conversation because we're out of time. But just quickly time. to add to that, you also cannot take out the fact that if you look at some of the security you know, officers who are expected to implement the law. Let's begin to look at, you know, the salary structure. Now, this is not to make an excuse, right? I'm not trying to hold brief for them. And you have raised very valid and resilient point, especially the, the fact that they're not supposed to collect. But I've witnessed a scenario. Now, this is what usually takes place. If you're supposed to pay like a 200, you, you actually commit a rude offense. And the people or the Nigerian you know, the person who is a culprit knows that you're expected to pay a certain amount. Let's say uh, the law that you broke is expected that you pay a fine of 200,000 error. Uh, there's always, you know, more like a negotiation. There's a bid. Someone tells you, okay, if I take you to the office now, you're going to pay 200,000 error. But <laughs> there's also another. So it gives you an office. So, but when the officer tells you that if I take you to the office, you're going to pay 200,000 error, it's already suggestive that there's an option and so you as a person and you as a nigerian that you are as a legotion begin to consider the other option which means that uh, that's possible that you can negotiate and the negotiation would mean that okay what can you offer so they get into the talk of um but why don't i give you fifty thousand error and I'd be like no i have to take you i have to take you then they begin to pull off that stunt eventually enter by saying because you don't want to go to the station they would let you know what it would take you know your car will be impounded or taking you to the office is not going to be easy and all of that whatever and so um 
the person in question is in a hurry. They, they don't want to be apprehended. They don't want to be caught up in all of that space because of the stress it would cause. And so then they, they opt for the easy way. And so they say, okay, um, I, I have 50,000. Can we just do this for 50,000? And so it goes on. Now, we have moved beyond the fact where people begin to collect money. No one wants to collect money directly because they know that the media is there when era of social media that would be recording and what have you and so say, hey, you do a transfer or what have you. They probably is not send it to their direct account. There's an account that I can be sent to. But these are all of the gimmicks. But as much as we say we want to fight corruption and corrupt practices amongst ourselves, institution of government, I think that the government also needs to do her bid. We need to be in a situation where, um, you know, these persons are probably taken care of now. As a disclaimer, I'm not trying to endorse corruption and corrupt practices. But we're saying that poverty and corruption is like a twin. It's a cousin that work hand in hand. And there's no way you're going to talk about that without the other. So let's also do better. As much as we want to see better, better in you know the uh, systems as government, then we also need to do better, you know, with these officers. But quickly, let's move on to the next one. It's quite saddening, but it's um, is a phenomenon that must happen to everyone that leaves. We all will die, and someday I would also, you know, die. But the question that a lot of people ask, and people constantly says, uh, what will you be remembered for? We talk about, you know, legacy. We talk about how uh, you live your life. What will you be remembered for? These are some of the issues. However, fortunately, Nigeria has lost uh, her ambassador to Spain, Demola Siriki. He died in Spain after a brief illness. And this is according to an announcement that was being put out by, you know, his son via social media platform. Very unfortunate. And we pray that his soul rest in peace. All right. Um, I, I mean, he, he, Demola Serki is, of course, Nigeria's um, ambassador to Spain. He died at the age of 63 in the Spanish capital, Madrid. Um, and, of course, um, he was said to have died in the early hours of the day. Uh, it's really sad. Um, this is what the family said. Quote, it is with heavy hearts and profound gratitude to Almighty Allah that we announce uh, the loss of our much-loved much an admired patriarch, a husband, a father, grandfather, a brother, uncle, friend, His Excellency Ambassador Demola Serki on December 15, 2022. He passed away peacefully, surrounded by his family in Madrid, Spain. Uh, so uh, some facts about him. He was born on November 13, 1959. Uh, he was a politician, teacher, businessman, uh, and public administrator. He served until his death as a Nigerian ambassador to Spain, a position he assumed uh, in January 2021, with concurrent accreditation as a permanent representative uh, to the United Nations World Tourism uh, Organization. He previously served as Nigeria's Minister of State uh, for Defense. So he's had a distinguished career in politics and uh, national service. Uh, he was, um, uh, I think he, he, he was part, he tried to get into uh, the Senate, you know, you know, on this part, on APC's platform. You know, he had some issues with Amcon and all that, but we won't go into that now. Let's allow the family mourn him, uh, you know, before we add all those things. So, but seven things, you know, about the man, of course, uh, until his death, like we said, he was uh, Nigeria's ambassador to the Kingdom of Spain uh, with concurrent accreditation as permanent representative to the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Demola Sirki was born uh, on Lagos Island on November 30, 1959. Uh, he, he had his early education in Nigeria and later proceeded for undergraduate up and postgraduate studies in the United States of America, where he practiced BSc and MSc in accounting from the City University of New York uh, in the United States of America. He was a grassroots politician. He was a grassroots politician. He began his career as a clerical officer uh, at Lagos City Council, Lagos Island, in 1978. Quite a long and distinguished career in politics. Uh, at a national level, Seriki was a former Minister of Agriculture and Water Resources. Uh, yeah, he was also a former Minister of State for Defense, uh, Minister of Mines and Steel Development, and also Interior. Uh, so he held those portfolios, quite distinguished. Uh, in May 2009, uh, the Oba of Lagos, His Royal Highness Oba Rihuana Kiolu, confirmed on Debola Seriki the chieftaincy title of uh, the Otuma Are, Are okay, of Lagos. Uh, and of course, um, he is survived by wives and, and children. A really sad one. Uh, very handsome man. 
you know, and uh, he said, Lego Legoshin, uh through and through. So we say, may his soul uh, rest in peace. I think that's the much I will say uh, about that. He died too early, um, but may his soul rest in peace. He's achieved um, what, what he can, and he's achieved a lot, and he's written his name on the sands of time. Uh, his, his achievements in the uh, annals of, the, of legal state, government, public service, and politics are well documented. I, I, I mean, I hope that at, at 63, I'll be able to say I also achieved something equal to him. He's, he's done his bit. Um, and I know his family will miss him. I know members of his community will miss him. His constituency will miss him. Uh, I, I would have loved to have seen him in the Senate. You know, it would have been a, uh, a nice addition from the looks of it, from his experience, to uh, robust conversations on the floor of the Red Chamber. But may so rest in peace. All right, um, we'll leave it at that. Uh, before I go, Mercy, are you aware that uh, Nigeria uh, voted? Because Demula was a permanent representative to the World Trade, Trade uh, Tourism Organization. That's the United Nations body, you know. And um, it is one of the organs under one of the, it's one of the, um, uh, what do you call it again, the subsidiary organizations, the WTO under the one of the six arms main arms of the un we have six main arms of the un you know like the uh, un general assembly un security council uh you know and, and all that one that one is the uh, economic united nations economic and social council okay ecosoc economic and social council and they had a vote yesterday uh, to remove iran uh, the islamic republic of iran uh, from the the UN's Commission on the Status of Women. That is also another commission under uh, ECOSOC, which is the Economic and Security uh, Social Council of the United Nations. Why were they having this vote? Because the United Nations um, made a, 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 a proposal, okay, a resolution or a proposal saying that Iran, because of the current uh, protests against the killing of uh, Misa ha Hamini, the Iranian woman who was who died in police custody after being arrested by the morality police for not wearing her hijab well, mm. or wearing it loosely, and her hair was showing. You know, and that led to protests across Iran with women cutting their hair, you know, throwing the hijab and burning it and all that. And several, you know, people being arrested. It's the version of NSAS. The United States, you know, after lobbying by various, you know, international um, uh, activists brought that, that, res that uh, resolution to say, let's vote either to keep Iran in this UN Commission on the Status of Women, which is a uh, commission that um, uh, looks into the, uh, uh, promotes the rights of women, okay, and gender equality. So these activists lobbied the US to say, you know, we can't have Iran in a commission that promotes gender equality and then uh, women's rights. When, you know, look at what's happening in that country, so they voted to remove Iran. But the interesting thing is that Nigeria uh, voted to keep Iran, against removing Iran from that, uh, from that commission, the UN Commission on the Status of Women. Nigeria voted to keep Iran there. And it makes, it's a statement to show that this is a country saying, instead of even abstaining, mm. like a lot of other African countries who bury their heads in the sun like ostrich, because we don't know our left from our right you know, or maybe we are not aligned. Instead of abstaining or voting no, they voted yes. So it's the policy of the country, the federal government right now, the direction is that they are showing we support, you know, a regime and a country that does not protect or defend or recognize the rights of women, you know. And that is huge for me. Because, you know, in Iran, as a wife, you can't travel out of the country without your husband's permission, you know. And so Nigerians need to know that the federal government voted no don't remove Iran. In other words, Nigeria has, in principle, supported the Iranian regime or administration or government in its um, uh, uh, stance on the rights of women, which is against women's rights. 
I, and you that know, that, 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 that's actually a big irony uh, for us. I mean, it's the biggest irony for 2022 as, as a country, especially when we're big on the fact that we say we're advocating inclusion of women, women rights. I, I mean, for a country that is a democratic country, how do you begin to explain all of this? Now, Iran and her government has been big on killing people who have been demanding for their freedom and their rights. And uh, to think that Nigeria gave a, a nod to that, gave a plus to that, as against women's rights, against all that's going on, it's, it, you know, it calls for a lot of questioning. Now, this is a conversation that has not, you know, I don't think it has been highlighted. Uh, a lot has been talked about in uh, different media spaces, but it is what it is, and this is what's going on. But eventually, we begin to have um, all of the conspiracy theories as regards this particular action when you just oppose that, you know, with other theories or speculations that are going on. And I, I hope that, you know, uh, we don't begin to say that it's fake news or, you know, it's just another speculation because, you know, action already, it's speaking a different how 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 do you even explain that particular fact we're very we're democratic government and in a democracy one of the things that's very sure one of the things that a democratic government and system you know uh, preaches about or is strong on is this is the rights of the people you know human you rights know, you know mercy, fundamental you know you know the the, the thing and then i was listening to some conversations yesterday night you know um, <clears throat> yesterday afternoon, evening, I was seeing some things online. Uh, some people are saying, yeah, maybe the government is actually showing who they truly are. That, oh, the lady, um, M Mish Misa, or Misha, was, um, was killed or died in police custody in Iran for breaking of Because in Iran, there's no separation of government and state. For she wearing her hijab loosely and her hair was showing. You don't, if you, the morality police, if you walk like this in Iran, they will arrest you. You know, and but they're saying our own case here, Deborah, who was lynched on relief for, on relief for religious reasons and killed alive or burnt alive or lynched, you know, and it was captured on video. It was captured on video, and that this is even worse than what is what happened in Iran that led to all these protests. That maybe we need to tell ourselves the truth that we live in such an environment, you know, where the lady, because of what she said, people and government has not shown the body language, you know, not not tweeting now. They've not shown the body language to show that they, this is an unacceptable practice in Nigeria, you know, to go all out, all out, to take this personally. And, and we're moving on as if, so maybe we need to have some reflection, reflecting to see you know, how the government is voting. This is really, in, at the UNO, and I'm, I think the person who was there was Nigeria's permanent representative, because this is a major organ. You know, so this shows the federal government's pos position on things like this. So maybe we need to begin to tell ourselves the truth that we live in a country that thinks and believes and sees things like this. That you know, um, religion, <laughs> religion, religion is an issue that will supersede the constitution that protects the rights of people. I, even when you, you know, know, when we so live in, we uh, uh, especially when you're saying but this, this is, this is actually who we are. Oh. No, no, but, but it can't be who we are because government, yesterday, no, Kofi, it, Kofi, the yesterday, government, the government frames national life. This is what the government values. But, 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 but it doesn't, it Deborah, doesn't really add up. This is in contradiction. A presidential candidate even deleted a tweet and said he, he deleted there it. There was because, a reason why he deleted because, it. Because but he didn't approve it. Okay, now, have you approved it? Do you support? Okay, now tweet now. Let's but Kofi, see. you know, these are the issues. For instance, I'm sure that yesterday you're also aware of the news of a, uh, an Islamic cleric that has been sentenced or will be sentenced uh, for blasphemy, right? And so we, we live in a society By where the constitution, yeah, okay. yeah so you, we have uh, the uh, secular law and what have you on the constitution. And for how long will we continue? Because what is obtainable in a certain part of the country well, the, the, is not obtainable, you know. We have, we have the penal code and the criminal code. Yes. You know, in, in, Iraq, in, Iraq, they, in Iran, they, they have a penal law. No, but, but okay. so, so I think it's time that we begin to question ourselves and ask what kind of government that we practice. Are we a democratic government? What yeah. system, what governs, yeah. you know, our activities as a people? And I, I think Nigerians should also make, make, make this a very important aspect of questioning and deciding and determining who they're going to vote for in 2023. Yeah, you know, people come to talk about the economy, all right? Uh, people come to talk about you know, um, uh, you know, insecurities will well do. But I think a very good way of deciding who to vote for is to look at their credentials on human rights. Human rights. Human rights, very important. Not what they put in a manifesto. 
know what they come out to say. And look at the antecedent. Don't, and also look at Don't even look at that. It's, it's a waste of time. If you're doing that, then you don't know what you do. You are lost. Look at what they've been doing, okay, in the past years. Even during the campaign, have they tried to trample on the rights of people? Have they tried to trample on the rights of Nigerians, of, of media, of civil society? Okay, if they were governor at some point or center, did they disrespect rights? Did they use their power brashly? Then number two, look at how many of them, which of them, has condemned... Kofi, we have to go... Sorry, my dear, how, has condemned the views of human rights, okay? Which of them has condemned, who, who among the presidential candidates has have condemned uh, human rights abuses? I've come out openly to wholeheartedly say, I stand against this, let it be on record, and then look for those people to vote well, for. We need to go now, and that's because Very important. Uh, we have to come back with the papers Cause, this morning. Because they were going to oppress you if, if, if they've been doing this before now. They will oppress you when you're elected and you, you can't do anything for eight years. It's very important, human rights. We'll take that break. <laughs>